Hurricane Katrina storms across the American South, faster and more furious than ever anticipated. This is the story of those left in her path. This whole place is going underwater. When the big one finally came, people in the world's most powerful nation thought they'd be protected. Their government would come to the rescue. But following the hurricane called Katrina, society broke down. The most vulnerable were abandoned. Use my French, everybody in America. But I am pissed. We're devastated. We haven't eaten in three days. George W. Bush, get out the White House and come help us. It's not going exactly right. We're going to make it go exactly right. No water. No food. We don't have a home. We lost everything. We have <laughs> The FEMA director is working 24. People got to do something. You ain't got no more food. We got babies out here. We got handicapped people. It's so sad. It's On too the too floor. Old. She's My dying right man. now. Two people died already. Where's the people? Where's the mail? Please, somebody. We need some help out here. We out of here. We want to get out of here. I don't even know if my kids are alive, man. Hurricane Katrina took many lives, but it was human failure that cost many more. How could a superpower fail its people so completely? The state knew what its responsibilities were. Authorities were warned well in advance as to exactly what would happen after a major hurricane strike. The federal government knew what its responsibilities were. They knew exactly how many people would be stranded, how many shelters would be needed, how much water and food was required. There was a plan but nobody delivered. Delve into a different storm of confusion, delay, and failure, and see how a natural disaster degenerated into a man-made tragedy. Katrina, unnatural disaster. Have you ever been to New Orleans? The laid-back, fun-loving streets that would be flooded with panic and mayhem. Ordered society was about to collapse in the city dubbed the Big Easy, its jazz rhythms replaced with discord and unheeded cries for help. Home to half a million people, New Orleans partied on fragile ground, most of it below sea level. With the Gulf of Mexico to the south, Lake Pontchartrain to the north, and the Mississippi River winding through the center, most streets are two meters lower than the sea surrounding them. Behind a system of levees, the city was living on borrowed time. For years, engineers and forecasters had repeatedly urged authorities to fix the levees they knew would not withstand the force of a big hurricane that was overdue. Typically, the issue came down to money, and the government was not prepared to pay. When you look at the value of a city like New Orleans, it's a major, major port. There's a lot of, of oil and gas and other chemical activities. If you take all of that into account, the, 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 the few hundreds of millions that have been spent on the levees to date uh, is, are peanuts, really, in terms of the value of that city. In July 2004, authorities conducted a kind of war game to see what would happen when a major hurricane made a direct hit on New Orleans. They called the computer model Hurricane Pam. The results were staggering. The simulation showed floodwaters surging over the levees, swamping the city. Pam predicted tens of thousands dead, hundreds of thousands injured, and half a million homeless. The model also showed how a breakdown of communications and infrastructure would cripple local and state governments. Washington would handle the crisis through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. After a week of worst-case scenarios, a plan was in place should the real thing strike. Local authorities trusted that FEMA would come to the rescue as promised should the worst happen. Everything that's, that's part of a complex catastrophic disaster such as Katrina was discussed during the Hurricane Pam exercise. One year later, that plan would be put to the test. Wednesday, August the 24th, 2005. It's hurricane season, big storms are expected, and a NASA satellite tracks a tropical storm battering the Bahamas. Storms are named according to a series of World Meteorological Organization lists that alternate between male and female names. This one will be called Katrina. 
As Katrina veers towards Florida, a well-rehearsed action plan is underway. Hurricanes are one of the few disasters that give you lead time, that you can really kind of plan things ahead of time. It's not the government, but the retail giant Walmart that is first in to protect its supplies and staff. If a supermarket chain can protect itself, surely a superpower can do the same. The next day, Thursday, August the 25th, Katrina delivers a taste of what's to come, tearing through bridges and buildings in Florida, causing 14 deaths and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. The next day, Katrina heads back out to sea, gathering fearsome strength and bearing towards the Gulf. States in the hurricane's path, including Louisiana, prepare for a state of emergency. Oil production is shut down in a region that produces a quarter of the nation's energy supplies. But in the city most under threat, the bars are rocking. While New Orleans rocks, the National Hurricane Center has issued what will be an uncannily accurate forecast. Katrina will hit less than 100 kilometers away. Coming up, how a storm became a killer, how to make a man-made disaster. Terrible, hollow feeling. Why aren't greater measures being taken? And how a major city and its most vulnerable people were abandoned. Saturday, August the 27th, Katrina has strengthened to a Category 4 superstorm her clouds spanning an area the length of Britain. The policy is very simple. It's get out of here, and get out of here as quickly as we possibly can. After low-lying areas around New Orleans are evacuated, former TV executive New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin sounds the alarm. This is the real deal. He advises people to evacuate and says the Superdome football stadium will be opened the next day as a shelter of last resort. Built on an old graveyard, the stadium seats 70,000. But as the Hurricane Pam exercise showed, more than 100,000 people stuck without a car would need transport, food, and shelter. Others willing and able to go join crawling queues on gridlocked highways. Many are left behind, which should be no surprise. Emergency plans have detailed the fact that at least 100,000 do not have transport. It's the poor and underprivileged who are left behind, most of them in the sprawling Ninth Ward, more than a meter below sea level. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, sends just 262 people to rescue two entire states. Experienced crisis managers fear it's too little, too late. And as this went along Saturday night and into Sunday, I think all of us just felt this, this terrible, hollow feeling why aren't greater measures being taken? The man in charge of America's disaster relief agency, FEMA, is former lawyer Michael Brown. But in a nation programmed to fear terror as its greatest threat, FEMA has been downgraded, its budget slashed, a mere subdivision of the vast Department of Homeland Security. The problem with putting FEMA into the Office of Homeland Security was that it took it out of the White House. And there is nothing more uh, effective for any government agency than being right next to the president. This hurricane would prove more robust than the federal organization responsible for dealing with it. By Saturday night, Katrina is developing into a cataclysmic category four to five, the worst a hurricane can get. For New Orleans, the only protection from Katrina's 240 kilometer an hour winds and four meter waves is the outdated levee system. A year before, the Hurricane Pam simulation showed that such a storm would overwhelm the inadequate defenses with devastating consequences. Successive governments have been unwilling to pay for major upgrades required. Now, of course, it's too late. On Saturday night, severe flood warnings are issued. In the Big Easy, the message is yet to get through. The bars are heaving as usual on a Saturday night. FEMA's own report will note the bars were rocking. 
Jazz trumpeter Kermit Ruffins is among them. Bars are packed. Saw a lot of friends and real typical New Orleans um, humor. Hey man, this place will be underwater tomorrow. By Sunday, the joke has worn thin. Katrina is less than a day away. Confusion takes hold in New Orleans as the Superdome opens as a makeshift shelter. Local authorities won't enforce an evacuation. The FEMA director says they should. Voluntary evacuations right now. I'll tell you this personally. If I lived in New Orleans, I'd be getting out of there. Eventually, the call to evacuate becomes more urgent. This is going to be an unprecedented event. We want everybody to get out. Of course, the Hurricane Pam exercise a year before proved that this would be impossible. Those without transport have no choice but to stay put. We've got oil, we've got water, we've got food. Pray for us. Pray for all of New Orleans. Without outside help, the mayor doesn't have the manpower to enforce a mandatory evacuation. But officers urge those who can to get out. Buses are scrambled to bring refugees to the Superdome. America's rail authority claims the city refuses its offer to put evacuees on the last train. Those who've sat through previous storms can see that this one is different. Normally, I would stay home, you know, and board up my windows. My fiance said, Kermit, we better get out of here. By Sunday evening, many of those left behind have been bused to the Superdome. There are supplies, including 50,000 ration pack meals. But with more than 10,000 people gathering, less than five meals ahead won't go far. After tonight, nothing will be the same. The immense storm heading towards them has strengthened. Inside the Superdome, the roar is eerie, frightening. Early Monday morning, August the 29th. The howling wind is driving a surging wall of water more than five meters high towards the fragile levees. The barriers in the east are the first to go. The levees along the industrial canal known as the Funnel suffer an explosive break. East New Orleans is swamped, entire neighborhoods are drowning. More water pours in as the storm surge overwhelms levees on Lakeside. The city is going under, exactly as forecast has predicted. But only those who've survived to escape the deluge know what's going on. How you doing, man? I had to leave out of my house, man. I don't know whether that water's coming over that levee or what. I don't, the last I heard, it's not. So I, you haven't heard about that water coming over that levee from the lake? No, check it out. Because the water started rising so high in my two-story apartment, I had to get out. If anyone is monitoring the failing levees, no warning is going out. That is one of the, the, the real tragedies, in my view, of Hurricane Katrina, is that the people weren't told that the flood was coming. The massive storm surge rages on, heading northeast to the Mississippi coast. Towns like Waveland, Biloxi, and Gulfport are inundated. Well, there's the Gulf of Mexico right there, coming into our parking lot. Man, and we're still about an hour, hour and a half away from the worst winds. The water's coming in, in the room. Oh, man. Some save themselves or are lucky to be rescued from the deluge. Well, we're in the lobby here of our hotel. We're completely underwater in this first store here. There's uh, chairs floating by. Jim, look at this over here. I think the eye is very close. Monday, August the 29th, and New Orleans awakes to a living nightmare. 
The levees are being breached. Streets are starting to disappear underwater. National Guard troops brought in to help can't even help themselves. They're trapped in their own barracks. It was 14, 15 feet high in the armory in just in, in less than an hour. You could physically just sit there and watch it inch by inch going up the walls of the armory. Across the city, people have to break through roofs to escape drowning. There is no warning. We were in a single story uh, duplex, you know. I mean, it came up to our steps probably within the first hour, and then uh, uh, probably came up further into the house within the next two hours. I had to uh, ax through into our neighbors. Drive along. Right, so and then get it. whatever perishables we could because ours were running out. And then we had to swim about 40 feet and get into another neighbor's house to get upstairs to, to the second floor. If the waters rose high enough in your home, the potential is you drowned in your attic if you couldn't break your way out. The director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency charged to help New Orleans, is more than 100 kilometers away in Baton Rouge. It's only now, after a direct hit from one of the worst hurricanes on record, that he asks Homeland Security for a thousand relief workers. Critically, emergency services ready to help are ordered to stay put. Following protocol, the FEMA chief insists on linking up with local and state authorities first. But communicating with the authorities is impossible. Katrina has knocked out telephone, television, and radio services. New Orleans waits for federal help that's being held up outside state borders. The city's levee system continues to crumble. Changing winds blow the storm surge over barriers to the south. Floodwaters overwhelm the 17th Street and London Avenue canals. Apparently, those responsible for the levees are still not monitoring the disaster or relaying any warnings that could save lives. You could have gotten helicopters with bullhorns and gone out and warned people that the big flood's coming. Yeah. But there are numerous ways that you could have done that. And uh, it doesn't seem to have happened, not based on all the survivors that I've spoken to. Local rescue operations get underway, but there's no backup or coordination. The police network is in chaos. Officers are working alone, or in this case, with a press photographer. We pulled up to a roof to rescue a young man, and he, he waved us off and said, look, I'm fine, but there's some old people in that house right there. And as we pulled up, there was a, a, an elderly couple. I would guess they were probably in their 70s in a single-story dwelling. Downtown New Orleans is thrashed. Apart from residents recording their own disaster, the devastating flooding in New Orleans is still unreported. The White House and the rest of America is led to believe that New Orleans had once again dodged the bullet. It was the, the best eventuality of the worst possible scenario. <laughs> uh, they dodged the bullet, but they still uh, got a, a sound uh, bruising. The media were what people relied on back in Washington to get a picture of what was going on there. And when the report was that everything looked OK on uh, Monday afternoon, that's the impression that was conveyed back in Washington. But New Orleans and the Gulf Coast are not OK. More than a day after Katrina strikes, survivors are swimming amid rotting corpses in flooded streets. Tuesday, August the 30th. Outside the devastation of the Gulf states, America awakes to a false dawn. The New York Times headline reads, Escaping feared knockout punch, New Orleans is one lucky big mess. The truth is that 85% of the city is underwater. 200,000 homes are destroyed. Thousands of residents are trapped among them most of the city's police force. In the critical 24 hours after one of America's worst natural disasters, local, state, and federal authorities still don't know what's happening. I don't think there was a system for them to push the SOS button. 
you know, from the state, the city, state, local level that said, we've got a, we've got a big problem here. There is still no coordinated rescue or relief effort. In the Big Easy, thousands are fighting an increasingly desperate battle for survival. The storm has long passed, but the flood remains. The Superdome's population has soared to 25,000, and food, water, medical supplies, power, and plumbing have run out. It's a cesspit. The state governor calls for a full evacuation of the Superdome, but surrounding streets are flooded. We want help! We want help! help Wednesday, August the 31st. It's been more than two days since Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, and the relief operation is in chaos. When the hurricanes was going on in Florida, they ran over there to help us. Here we in our own town, and they will not give us nothing. President Bush flies over New Orleans, but does not stop to see the grim reality on the ground. Unlike Air Force One, there's no electricity, no water, no air conditioning, no relief from sweltering 35 degree temperatures. No water, no food. No food. We got babies out here. We got handicapped people. We got people dying in the We're building. starving out here. We got people that... With news reports finally showing a major American city turning into a third world wasteland, the president sends in a Louisiana born celebrity general to restore order. I give the president uh, some credit on this. The embattled mayor is impressed. He sent one John Wayne dude down here that can get some stuff done. And his name is General Honore. And he came off the doggone chopper. And he started cussing and people started moving. Having already directed troops to aid Mississippi, the no-nonsense commander opens up a new front in New Orleans. The big difference is Mississippi didn't have standing water. It didn't have comms, it didn't have roads, but the water went back to sea. In the case of New Orleans, it created this big tub of water right in the center. Mayor Nagin predicts the death toll in New Orleans alone will be in the thousands. State officials fear up to 10,000 dead. These figures will prove vastly exaggerated. Helicopters carry wounded and sick evacuees here to Louis Armstrong Airport, which is fast becoming a makeshift hospital. I've never seen anything like this before. Everyone's doing the best that they can. We need insulin. On the streets outside, law and order is also in a critical condition. The mayor orders troops to stop searching for survivors and start hunting looters. But for many, breaking the law is the only way to survive. They so said we could come in and get the necessities. I don't have any clothes or nothing. I'm just getting food. Others are clearly stealing property. But thieves outnumber police officers. The state governor refuses to redeploy National Guard troops from search and rescue missions. Society is breaking down in the Big Easy. Coming up, the brave individuals succeeding where an entire government has failed. And who is to blame? The president said he's going to lead the investigation into what went wrong. He need to look only in the mirror. The recriminations begin. In the days following Katrina, while reports of mass rape and murder in the city's Superdome and Convention Center turn out to be false, there's no denying the desperation of those abandoned by the authorities. I don't have home. I had home downtown. But it's gone. It's under the water. I have nothing. Nothing. 
They have over 3,000 people out of here with no home, no shelter. What are they going to do? What are we going to do? It seems those in power are still unsure. Reports say the president offers to take control of the state's relief effort and National Guard. The Louisiana governor will deny that any such offer was made. It's an issue of control. If she had allowed the president to take over the National Guard, she feared political recrimination. Here again is where politics immediately takes part, uh, it enters into these considerations. With the authorities seemingly in disarray, ordinary people are doing extraordinary things. The owner of a small bus company in another state delivers food and emergency supplies to Louisiana. The Walmart supermarket chain is working with the Red Cross. We needed to start sending five trailers a day in to support Jefferson Parish to provide them water, dry food. I remember there was one load of chainsaws to help cut some of the people out of the buildings. Across the Gulf Coast, people have been left to fend for themselves. FEMA, Red Cross, you know, they got a few feeding trucks into the areas, but the assistance that you would typically think for a storm this magnitude in an area that was so hardly hit, they just didn't show up. Wednesday, two and a half days after Katrina, and not one person has been evacuated from New Orleans. until 20-year-old Jabbar Gibson commandeers a school bus and bravely drives his family and other refugees over a grueling eight-hour trip to Texas. And the relief center set up at the Houston Astrodome that's been standing empty for days. City, state, and federal authorities are being shown up in their ineptitude. The next day, President Bush only adds to that perception on national television. I don't think anybody anticipated the breach of the levees. A breach was widely predicted and spelt out during the Hurricane Pam exercise. Uh, when I was asked to brief this aide to basically explain what could happen to New Orleans, to talk about we were going to flood the city, we were going to have 300,000 people are going to have to be rescued, there'd be a large number of drownings. The president's popularity plummets as his critics close in. The president said he's going to lead the investigation into what went wrong. He need to look only in the mirror. In God's name, where the people were supposed to give water, support, people were dying there, what in heaven's name was happening? In New Orleans, more than 20,000 stranded evacuees are asking the same question. It'll be another full three days before they're all delivered from the squalor. The Army General, dubbed John Wayne, appears to be the only one to have an answer. Send these trucks back for another load. Yes, sir. Make that happen now. But yes, the General can't control everything. Progress is slow. This whole humanitarian thing comes down to logistics. You can't get buses in there because of the water. Then we could get them in there. We had to bring them in two at a time. General Honoré also has no control over state officials who knock back vital Red Cross services they say they can't guarantee the medic's safety when they cross the border. Not only in New Orleans, but across the Gulf, the need is vast. In devastated Mississippi towns, help is also slow to arrive in widespread communities. George W. Bush, get out the White House and come help us. Police ain't help. There's been one Salvation Army truck come by. You know, they set up over there. They stayed there about three hours. They were gone. Tragically, many are beyond help. But in New Orleans, at least, work begins on plugging the gaping holes in the levees, restoring some kind of order, and recovering the victims. How's we check before this guy's dead yet? But almost four days after the most devastating storm to hit the region, help is only just arriving for traumatized survivors who've lost everything. My kids are dead. I wasn't there. I come home, you know, I went out to get my money, you know. I come back, everything's underwater, my, my, my wife's gone. 
I don't want to talk about it, man. Rescuers who might have saved lives arrived too late, held up for days while officials waited for the correct paperwork. There was no communication with the right hand to know what the left hand was doing. And we are all organized, we're certified, we got rescue boats, and they told us to sit. Back at the New Orleans Convention Center, despite an army general's best efforts, thousands remain stranded without food and water. Under pressure, a furious city mayor explodes during a radio interview. Excuse my French, everybody in America. But I am pissed. Mayor Nagin slams state and federal officials in the first of a series of broadsides. We don't do another press conference until the resources are in this city. Now get off your asses and let's do something. And let's fix the biggest goddamn crisis in the history of this country. The third world squalor across one of America's major port cities has become a national disgrace. Four days after Katrina, there's still little sign of FEMA on the ground. But its director, Mike Brown, does appear on Don't national television. television. Don't you guys listen to the radio? Our reporters have been reporting about it for more than just today. We learned about it factually today that that's what existed. We've been so focused on doing rescue and life-saving missions and evacuating people from the Superdome that when we first learned about it, of course, my first gut instinct, instinct was get somebody in there the FEMA chief also claims to have been caught by surprise at the numbers of homeless. And then I think the other thing that really caught me by surprise was the fact that there were so many people, and I'm not laying blame, but either chose not to evacuate or could not evacuate. Of course, the Hurricane Pam exercise and comprehensive state reports to FEMA had clearly pointed out that thousands of residents would be unable to flee without transport. Friday, September the 2nd, more than four days after one of the country's most severe natural disasters, the president finally visits the disaster zone. But the commander-in-chief only ventures as far as Mobile, Alabama, to respond to the growing criticism of the chaos in New Orleans. It's not going exactly right. We're going to make it go exactly right. If there's problems, we're going to address the problems. And, and, that's, and that's what I've come down to assure people. Even the embattled FEMA Brown, chief gets praise. The FEMA director is working 24 Midday the same day. After enduring days of hunger and filth, the thousands of homeless survivors at the New Orleans Convention Center are finally being evacuated by the Louisiana National Guard. As they're flown to shelters around the country, President Bush arrives at Louis Armstrong Airport for talks with the state governor and city mayor. In the Air Force One presidential office, George W. Bush met with Mayor Nagin and state governor Kathleen Blanco. The mayor later described his version of events. We're in Air Force One. I say, Mr. President, Madam Governor, you too have to get in sync. If you don't get in sync, more people are gonna die. Governor Kathleen Blanco again rejects the president's proposal for a federal takeover of the relief effort. The president returns to Washington, D.C. and authorizes the first of many emergency relief measures. Monday, September the 5th, more recriminations. The mayor takes another shot at the governor, comparing the state's apparent lack of direction to General Honoré's popular style. And when he hit the field, we started to see action. And what the state was doing, I don't freaking know. The next day, Tuesday, September the 6th, the levees are slowly being plugged and pumps brought in. We established a separate task force, task force on watering, so that they could focus totally on just pumping out water and getting the pump stations operational. But again, progress is slow. Friday, September the 9th, 10 days after Katrina, New Orleans is still inundated with filthy, polluted water.
Despite the health risk and lack of clean water, not everyone who rode out the storm and subsequent crisis wants to leave. You're gonna die, man. I'm telling you, you're gonna die. I don't want you to die, man. I know you. Backed by the boot force of the National Guard, Mayor Nagin orders everyone to leave the city. Again, clashing with the governor, who says he has no authority to do so. Where local, state, federal forces and volunteers have cooperated, there have been almost 50,000 successful rescues. And FEMA has delivered 18 million packaged meals and 10 million gallons of drinking water to flood victims. But these are its few successes. Volunteers have played a key role. Y'all have met us in never need, never way. And we quit lives for no more. Record donations add up to more than a billion dollars. Public generosity is at an all-time high. Two weeks into the crisis, some telephone lines are up, and recorded conversations are full of fury from local officials still unable to contact FEMA. We thought we were going to have a meeting with uh, Baton Rouge people, the FEMA people, yesterday. They canceled that one, so I don't know where we are with it, other than it's just creating downright chaos. Local authorities are furious that the federal agency has not supplied emergency housing, a specific FEMA responsibility. They made commitments to the city of Clyde Elk for 400 uh, trailers. None of us know who the guy was that uh, took those trailers. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, 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 that's what
the, the pressure from the water push these Where the water has been pumped away, stark evidence that the levees were too weak. And the dirt Army went. engineers failed. And then the water just pushed in. Down on the other side, they just fell. Because those rebars and that concrete could not hold all this. It's too heavy. Some of the city's giant pumps have begun to send the floodwaters back into Lake Pontchartrain. People are returning to inspect their homes. As you can see, this used to be a pretty nice block. With the houses, mostly families. All lived here. All of the family. Munley, Kate, Mr. Hamp, Ms. Johnson, Yancey's, Fletcher's, you know. Uh, Lange, had the barbershop there. City Council President Oliver Thomas visits his neighborhood in the ruined Ninth Ward and the house where he grew up. I said I, that I, all my crime was, was done. But I guess it's not. This is the house my, my father used his GI Bill to buy this house so we wouldn't have to rent. I don't live with family anymore. As authorities search more neighborhoods in New Orleans, the death toll climbs. Over the next month, it will exceed 1,200 across Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. The Gulf Coast has lost its battle with Hurricane Katrina. Survivors remain trapped for days while the most powerful nation on Earth failed to help its own people. Hardly inspiring from a nation leading the war on terror overseas, yet apparently unable to handle a crisis at home. I think that people in this country had a right to believe that the country was being made more safe after September 11th. Everybody dropped the ball on this, there's no question about it. Tuesday, September the 13th, under intense pressure and criticism, President Bush finally accepts some responsibility for the Katrina fiasco. Katrina uh, exposed serious problems in our response capability at all levels of government. And to the extent that the federal government uh, didn't fully do its job right, I take responsibility. Uh, select the video come to work. Washington, D.C., Tuesday, September the 27th. Good morning and welcome to this morning's hearing. Rise with me and raise your right hand. Unlike the president, the former FEMA director, Michael Brown, refuses to accept any blame before a special hearing into what went wrong after Katrina. I very strongly, personally, regret that I was unable to persuade Governor Blanco and Mayor Nagan to sit down, get over their differences, and work together. I just couldn't pull that off. My biggest mistake was not recognizing by Saturday that Louisiana was dysfunctional. The very next day, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco appears before a Senate committee, but does not bite back. You were criticized yesterday heavily by Mr. Brown. I'd just give you a chance here, if you would, would like to, to, to respond to that. Senator Conrad, I appreciate that, but uh, today I came really to talk about job creation. Monday, October the 17th, FEMA emails leaked to reporters suggest that the agency knew it was floundering. Michael Brown sent one to a colleague two days before Katrina struck. In it, he alludes to FEMA's 2004 Hurricane Pam war game. Look at this scenario compared to the planning we did for New Orleans, and well, you get the picture. Five days after Katrina, another email from a frustrated FEMA official in Mississippi reveals the extent of its failure. Resources are far exceeded by requirements, he writes, getting less than 25% of what we've been requesting from HQ daily. Katrina has Americans doubting whether its government, at any level, can save them from a major disaster or terrorist attack. After 9-11, Congress provided billions of dollars for cities and states to improve their evacuation plans. How good would those plans be in a crisis? New York City depends on its vulnerable public transport system to get people to safety. 
or Los Angeles, in the event of a catastrophic earthquake that would require people to flee the city, LA has no plan for evacuating millions of people or housing them. I don't see a water line. I may be lucky. Big gray house on the corner. While the rest of America has reason to be worried about the future, in New Orleans, residents like Kermit Ruffins are looking forwards. To look at that city now is just like, we can't wait to rebuild. I mean, it's all we can think about. That's my baby picture there. Some of my records right here. Nice kitchen back there. Remember those red beans and rice? Ruffins then checks out Vaughn's, the neighborhood bar where he's played a Thursday night gig for the last 13 years. One thing. It looks exactly the same. This place will be rolling in no time. All we need is electricity here. Built on a marsh, New Orleans will always be vulnerable to the waters surrounding it. But the big easy spirit isn't easily swept away. It may take a year for it to really start thriving again. We will swing again. More mega structures.